Well, let's move on now to our next story. A consortium of civil society organizations, CSOs in Zimbabwe, have written to the National Assembly Speaker Jacob Mudenda, expressing their concerns over the private voluntary organization's PVO amendment bill, which they say infringes on their work and autonomy. The letter states that civil society organizations that work to promote and defend freedom of expression, association and the right to privacy as fundamental rights worldwide are concerned with Zimbabwe's gazetted PVO amendment bill. According to the CSOs, the proposed law criminalizes the work of CSOs in the country. To tell us more on the proposed PVO amendment bill is Fiona Ilif, who is the research and advocacy manager Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights. Now, Fiona, uh, many thanks for joining the program, but let's, let's, let's understand really what stage this bill is at according to the Constitution of Zimbabwe. I mean, has it been passed already? Is it in its final stage? Or because we understand it has passed its second reading, but what stage is that bill? Um, <clears throat> so the bill was gazetted on the 5th of November, 2021. Um, and was supposed to be announced in Parliament and pu public hearings were supposed to be held in December. We were very concerned that the bill seemed to be being fast-tracked um, at the end of last year. But um, due to the COVID-19 lockdown regulations, the public hearings were postponed. Um, so we understand that Parliament is due to resume um, mid-February and that the public hearings are likely to proceed in March. So it hasn't actually been announced in Parliament as yet. It's just been gazetted as a bill so far. Now, uh, what threats does this bill pose to PVOs and what has prompted the government actually to uh, look into the amendment now? The, the, the bill is extremely worrying and very dangerous to NGOs. Um, there are a number of, of issues. Um, firstly, uh, it, it will require all uh, organizations collecting funds from the public or from outside the country uh, can be designated and required to register as private voluntary organizations. Uh, there are a lot of organizations that are currently operating as trusts or common law associations that may effectively be deregistered. So there will be a lack of security uh, of continued operations for non-governmental organizations. It also introduces a lot of criminal offenses. So it will criminalize legitimate activities of non-governmental organizations, particularly in relation to political issues, so-called political issues. There's also, it introduces a lot of um, provisions that will interfere in internal affairs of non-governmental organizations violating their right to privacy. So it's likely to result in a lot of raids and directives to supply documents. Uh, to the executive without court orders. And it also allows for suspension of executive committees of non-governmental organizations and for replacement of those committees with provisional trustees who have powers to even dispose of funds and assets of the organization. And generally, the bill introduces unilateral powers um, in the executive, that's the Minister of Public Service and the Registrar of Private Voluntary Organizations, um, to impose harsh measures on organizations, even to dismiss employees and directors. So it's generally moving away from self-regulation of the sector uh, to increase powers in the executive. It's also likely to restrict foreign funding, um, uh, which will have an impact on, on the beneficiaries of nonprofit organizations. And generally, this bill will result in less accountability um, and, and actually result in uh, more illicit financial flows, money laundering and terrorism. Uh, and the reason I mention uh, those is that the bill is allegedly supposed to address um, the Financial Action Task Force recommendations on counterterrorism and anti-money laundering. Right. That that, is what this... But isn't that a genuine concern by the government if they're doing all of this? They're talking about um, the ter the ter um, ensuring that these organizations are not used by terrorists to infiltrate the country. Isn't that really a genuine concern? It should be, yes. Um, generally, Zimbabwe is very low risk uh, for terrorism, but we have been placed under enhanced monitoring by our regional financial action task force body, that's the Eastern Southern African Anti-Money Laundering Group. Uh, but this is mostly due to issues of illicit financial flows and lack of transparency for beneficial owner ownership of corporate entities in the country. And we have been rated as um, partly, only partly compliant with Recommendation 8, which is in relation to non-profit organizations. 
Uh, but this is mostly due to the lack of a risk-based strategy to identify new risks in the sector um, and the lack of consultation with the sector, lack of policies to improve transparency and accountability, and a lack of inter international frameworks for sharing information. But this bill fa really fails to address those deficiencies. And there's even been a communication by the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Assembly and Association and three other UN Special Rapporteurs to the President on how this bill fails to comply with the Financial Action Task Force recommend Recommendation 8 and violates international human rights standards, particularly freedom of association, because the bill impacts on the whole sector and it doesn't consult the sector to identify risks and on how to mitigate risks. Um, and this is a problem globally. The Financial Action Task Force recommendations were, um, in, in, were expanded to include uh, counter-terrorism measures after 9-11, <clears throat> when there was a lot of fear and distrust globally, uh, but there wasn't really a consideration um, of how this would impact on the non-profit sector. So there have been a lot of studies uh, on how uh, this Recommendation 8 has impacted on non-profit organizations, and even the African Commission on Human and People's Rights has introduced guidelines on protection of rights while countering terrorism, because a lot of states have used these recommendations as an excuse to crack down on the non-profit sector unlawfully. Right. Now, now Fiona, right. just before we let you go, if this bill is passed, will operating PVOs be required to re-register or will they continue with your current registration? We're talking about validity of the PVOs now that are already registered. Under our current uh, Private Voluntary Organizations Act, there are specific exemptions. Um, so, so our current act is very restrictive, um, but because of these exemptions, a lot of non-profit uh, organizations are not registered under the act. So, for example, our organization is registered as a trust, and there are a lot of organizations operating as common law universities associations, which are exempt under the act. But once this bill becomes law, uh, then these organizations can be served with a notice or designated as being high risk to terrorism abuse. Uh, and with, it's likely that those operating uh, with foreign funding or in human rights and governance sectors may be uh, designated as high risk. And then they'll be required to, to register under the Act. And if a designated organization fails to register under the Act, under the bill, uh, they will be subjected to 10 years imprisonment. Um, our problem is that um, the registration process is very unclear. The, the requirements for registration are unclear. The time frame is unclear. So it's not um, that you notify a registrar and then you... you. All right, I think we just lost you there, Fiona Elif, um, the Research and Advocacy Manager, Zimbabwe Lawyers. For human rights but thank you so much that was such an insightful um, conversation we had with you looking at the PVOs in Zimbabwe and the bill which you have rightly said hasn't been passed yet but is still being put under consideration you're still watching breakfast central on news central now let's bring you a recap on some of the top stories we've brought to you so far <laughs>